Um, so I'm really, really pleased to have a chance to come and talk to you today. I was really uh, honored to be to ask to, to, to speak to you all. Um, what I'm going to try to do today is talk to you a little bit about Nextflow, not from the point of view of trying to convince you that it's a great thing, uh, because I mean you're here, like you decided to come to this this event. Um, for some people in the room, you might have run Nextflow for the very first time two days ago, uh, and for some people. You know, you, you wrote Nextflow. So this is this is a really diverse audience of people when it comes to your background and your interests and what you do. But I think the one thing I don't need to do is convince you that Nextflow is great. Um, instead, what I really want to focus on is is giving you a little bit of the the lessons and the experience that I've had trying to talk about Nextflow to other people. Um, if you run a core facility or a lab, then you're interacting with your users. Uh, with scientists who want to know why should I, why is Nextflow good for me? As a scientist who maybe, maybe doesn't use the command line, why is Nextflow helping me? If you're talking to people that are in your administration that don't do computing, you got to be able to tell them why is Nextflow good for me? Why is it making my, uh, why is it making it so that I'm spending my dollars better, that our budgets are being allocated better? Um, so what is this thing? that we call workflow managers, why do they make our lives better, and why do they make it so that we can do science better? Um, I noticed a lot of people that are, that are here are in the world of genomics in some way, and I think that there is something special about this advent of having workflow managers that are really useful. Um, so I want to summarize a little bit of what this is, try to put everything in context, and also give you some experience, some perspective on uh, the ways in which Nextflow has helped me in particular as a scientist. Um, not only with communicating science, but also just getting my science done better and faster. So a little bit of background on me and who I am. I am a, I'm a scientist, I'm a microbiologist. I got my PhD from Penn, where I was physically isolating viral particles from human stool samples, putting them on a genome sequencer, and trying to figure out what viruses are living in the human gut. Um, over time, I transitioned from working at the bench to working entirely at the computer. Um, after my PhD, I went and did a couple of things. Um, I think most, most recently of note, I worked at a, a great software company in San Francisco called One Codex. It's a startup, and we were building a web platform for microbiome analysis. Um, this led me to do a lot of cloud computing, but I really had an interest in getting back into science, and so I, uh, about two and a half, three years ago, I started working at the Fred Hutch Cancer Research Center in Seattle. Um, I'll tell you a little bit more about my work there, but this just to give you an idea. I'm a scientist. I use computers a lot. Uh, I'm not necessarily uh, trained in computer science. Um, I haven't taken any programming classes. This is just something that I do in order to get um, the rest of my work done. So I like to introduce, and I think this is something that might be helpful when we convey what it is about doing genomics um, or about doing the type of things that we need to get done. What's what's hard about this? We work in a field that you could call this big data, but we don't do big data like other people do. Some people doing big data are, you know, a friend of mine does spectral imaging, and when he gets his data, he pulls it down uh, from this czar format and analyzes it all using Dask on Kubernetes. None of what he does would be helped by using Nextflow because he doesn't have the challenges that we have with bulky data. So each individual measurement that we take when we do something like working in the microbiome, which is what I do, each individual raw data file is really large. We put a physical sample on a genome sequencer and it spits us back a raw text file that's a couple of gigabytes large. Um, that's a really enormous, really unwieldy piece of unstructured data. This is not typically data that you can just run on your laptop. We wouldn't be here if it was easy to analyze genomic data just on your laptop. When you analyze microbiome data, a lot of the things that you want to do with it um, are really heterogeneous. You can take a, a microbiome sample, you can do, you can assemble genomes, uh, you can do variant calling, you can try to calculate abundance of different things. Um, there's lots of different ways to analyze the same piece of data. So there isn't just one cookie cutter analysis pipeline that you can run for every single person who uses genomic data. So there's no standardized analysis, and I think this is really important. Also, the tools that we use, the tools that underlie all of genomics and, especially, and also microbiome science, um, these are really, um, really heterogeneous tool sets. 
there are scientists out there in the world that are trying to write better assemblers, better mappers. They write the best code that they can, uh, but ultimately no one's paying them to upkeep and maintain really professional grade software. Um, and so it can be very hard to manage all of these complex dependencies. There's a lot of great projects out there. We've talked about Conda and things like that. But at its core, managing the dependencies of scientific software is just a hard thing to do because there's not a lot of investment in it. These are all some of the challenges that come from doing microbiome science. And these are some of the things that I like to communicate to people when I'm saying, these are the things we need to overcome in order to get our jobs done. These are the things we come up against every day uh, just in trying to figure out what happened in our experiment. So when explaining to people what bioinformatics workflows are, I like to start out by saying that um, whenever you need to do any sort of computing, so you're maybe you're a graduate student or a tech and someone hands you some data and you've got to figure out what to do with it, um, the, the very basic things that we do uh, uh, can be thought of as the precursors of real bona fide workflow systems. So you think about trying to get a task done, um, and we're thinking about the command line. We've got some piece of input data, so a fast Q file coming off a sequencer, and let's say we want to align it against the human genome. I would do this to subtract host reads, for example. Um, so we have some input data. We need to have a human genome, right? Some, some reference to go against. And the process that we're trying to execute is doing this alignment. So we're actually calling BWA. Uh, it has some inputs. It has some outputs. And this is the, the first individual task you might have. Um, and there's not just one call you need to make. You need to then sort and index. You want to do something with this alignment file. And you might not want to do that uh, just uh, so before you run this, you also have to index the human genome. So there's actually a couple of different tasks that are, that are coming into play here. And um, all of this, you know, you might try this the first time just by hand, running all these commands on the command prompt. At some point, you realize you can put these inside a script, so you can make a, a, a bash script where you can just execute that script. And once you start writing something into a script, you start getting towards the functionality that we really need when we think about what workflows are. So you can think about looping over many different files. I want to do the same thing many different times. You can also think about um, adding some conditional statements in here. So, oh, sorry, then you also want to think about the dependencies. So you can use your bash script to do, for example, like module load if you happen to have access to like a module system on your HPC. Um, and then using scripts like this also give you dependencies. Like I only want to index the human genome if I haven't indexed it before because I probably did that you know, last week when I tried to do this. And these are the sorts of things that I just sort of came to when I started trying to do scientific programming in 2007. Um, and I think when most people start out doing some type of scientific computing, this is a typical place to start. You figure out what commands you need to run, you figure out how to run it, and then over time you start adding more complexity as you start becoming more sophisticated with this. Now what I like to communicate to people is that this very standard, very understandable approach to doing computing is the same as what we're trying to do with these workflows. This is a workflow, in a sense, and this illustrates the core concept of what workflows are. We have, an, we have a declaration. This is the framework that we're using um, to execute commands. We have some definition of the execution environment. So module load um, refers to specific bits of code that now exist in your environment. Um, we have a, an explicit data dependency. I need to have the referenced human genome. We have the ability to perform some call caching. I'm only going to index it if it hasn't been indexed before. Um, we have, this was what you might consider to be a scatter step. I'm doing the same thing over many different files. And within that scatter, I've got a set of chain tasks that all come together. So in a sense, this is a workflow. Um, and so what's, what's really different is that now we have mature software projects that formalize this. Now we have workflow managers. So instead of just running this all through a bash script that's very complicated, there now exist multiple different platforms out there in the world, open source platforms, that formalize this approach to doing computing. So I want to describe a little bit about what these are and also the ways in which they differ from each other. How is Nextflow different from other t um, projects that are trying to do the same thing? So um, there, are, there are some core features of these workflow managers that provide 
real value to us when we're trying to get our work done as scientists. And I think this is something that's really important to emphasize when we describe why it is that we came to, you know, we flew 5,000 miles to sit in a room in Barcelona and, and eat good food and, and talk to nice people, but also why it is that I keep talking about Nextflow to my colleagues. Like, I'm, I'm that guy who won't shut up about Nextflow. And sometimes I need to take a step back and say, no, it's because there's some real core functionality here that I can't get any other way. And these things really matter for me. So the fact that workflow managers support containers means that I have a much easier time controlling versions of tools. Docker and containers or Conda um, is really just a much, much more powerful way of controlling dependencies. When I clearly define a data flow through a workflow manager, then I can stop using file names for tracking. Uh, what I'm going to show you next is not intended as a criticism, but it is taken from an actual manual page um, from a widely used software package. And so I just mean to say that this is something that's very common. The, the name of the file is a record of all of the things that happened to create it. You started with stability.fasta. And then over time, you added all these suffixes. This is very common practice in scientific computing. Um, and so this will go on the web for a little while. This is terrible, right? <laughs> this is really bad. No, I'm serious. Like, we have no way of actually knowing how these files were made. But this is what people have been trained, have been ingrained into thinking, this is the best practice. This is not best practice. This is a crutch that's holding us back. Um, I'm sorry, Pat. Um, so. Having portability across compute infrastructures is something that you know, we, we take for granted. So we, we think about this and we think, oh yeah, it's portable across compute infrastructures. Like, that's great. And you know, your colleague at the bench might not know what this, what this means. So yes, this enables us to share workflows with collaborators. It's nice to share with collaborators. Some people don't particularly care about that because they just want to get their own work done. Um, and, um, but I think that when we think about sharing with collaborators, we're also thinking about sharing with ourselves in the future. Someone said earlier, um, uh, yeah, right, there was the ancient DNA pipeline, and then a module got updated on the cluster, and it broke everything, right? This happens a lot. Your most important collaborator is you in six months after IT made some important upgrade to the cluster, right? This is the point of sharing that we find to be the most challenging. This is actually, I just found yesterday when I was going through my slides, I thought, I'm going to put this in. So bioinformatics trick of the day, write all your bioinformatics pipelines using a combination of dense shell one-liners and unmaintained packages published by someone else in academia. It's job security by obfuscation. I think this is like a really real feeling that people have, and it ends up holding you back uh, because you get, um, you get tricked and you get... Uh, you get tri tripped up when, when there's something like systems updates and all of a sudden nothing that you do works anymore. So the last thing that I wanted to mention is retrieving cached calls. Um, so this is, this is a feature that's actually uh, relatively common across workflow managers. Don't run something if I've run it before. Um, this is an incredibly powerful feature I didn't even know existed. Um, and it's, it's really changed my life quite a bit. So when you have the ability to only run code uh, or specific uh, calls to a task, if you haven't done it before, it means you have a lot more ability to uh, iteratively develop your workflows. So I want to try changing this parameter. That didn't work. I'm going to try changing this parameter. Okay, I'm going to change this process. And rerunning everything, knowing that all the files you get at the end are exactly what you think they should be. Um, that's actually, it's hard to overstate how important that is and how many times that can trip you up um, when you're trying to do something manually. So, when people say, you say, hey, I want to take up this new thing, NextFlow. I think it's going to be the best thing for my core facility. Um, when you try to convey that to people outside of software, they, they tend to think about software existing on this continuum. You work in development, and then you work in production. right? You develop something until it's ready, and then it goes into production. Um, this is not the way science happens. Scientists are always moving back and forth between development and production. I don't say this because you don't know it. I just say it because I think it's good to remind people of this. Um, that's not how science actually works. So instead, um, I made a little uh, graphic because you can, uh, you can actually just, uh, Matplotlib has this little XKCD format. I don't know, I thought that was kind of um, So I like to, what was that? Yeah, XKCD, that's nice. Um, so I like to think about, um, the sort of development production dichotomy instead broken up by the number of different workflows. So this would be like, I do RNA-seq, but I also do like 
attack seek and I do microbiome analysis, like different types of things that you analyze data with. And then the other axis would be how many times do I run my RNA seq pipeline in a year or something like that. And I think most labs, I'm not totally sure on the numbers, um, and, but I think most labs kind of exist in this work, work in this load where you, you actually have something like a dozen different types of things that you might do in a year, but each of them you only run a handful of times, right? You've got some amount of different things, but you're not necessarily super high throughput. So in contrast, if you think about what a summer intern might do, they might come in and make one or two different pipelines, maybe there's batch scripts, and they might run each of them one or two times. Um, you have people that sometimes, large labs end up being really high throughput. So you might have a lab that says, yeah, we're doing RNA-seq and we're doing it on, uh, what did I say, hundreds of data sets over the course of a year. You know, they're spending a lot of money on Illumina. And then you have people that are at core facilities where they're running a lot of different things and they're doing it many, many times, right? And so you might ask, well, which of these people would benefit from something like a workflow manager? I'd say almost all of them. I wouldn't necessarily say that it's worth time for the summer intern to learn the ins and outs of writing their own Nextflow script. Maybe with something like NFCore, it's a little bit more possible. Um, actually, my estimation of most of this is kind of changing as I'm learning more about NFCore. But I'd say for everyone else, it's really, you get a lot of value out of using a workflow manager because the cost of figuring out that infrastructure is only incurred once, and then every other workflow that you develop, um, you get to rely, uh, you, get to, you get to utilize that investment that you made early on. Um, so this is, I think, the, 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 the sort of framework I'd like to convey when you say, why is it worth me investing in picking up Nextflow? It's because it'll help you, even if you're running many different work, many different types of workflows, or you're running each of them many different times. So a little bit about how I came into this. So why did I want to do anything with workflow managers? Well, I didn't. Um, I just wanted to use the cloud. So the last company I was at, we did everything in the cloud. It was great. I was super happy with it. Um, we had our own infrastructure that we had built, um, and I wanted something that replicated that. So I got to Fred Hutch. I went to the IT department, I said, can I get access to AWS? They said, sure, we'll set something up for me. They gave me a queue on AWS Patch. I then hard-coded all of my pipelines into, um, into, it doesn't matter, I did it manually. And it was fine for a while, but then it started really holding me back. And I started learning about workflow managers really as a way of, as a point of, as an inter intermediate point. I interact with the workflow manager and it takes care of everything that happens on the cloud. And I thought, this is great. Um, it worked really well for that. And then the nice surprise was I got all these side benefits. So only after I figured that out did I come to realize that actually workflow managers were making me more efficient. I was getting more done. Um, and I was able to make workflows that I could share with other people. Um, you know, obviously share with myself in the future. Um, but over the last few months, I've actually had an amazing success in communicating methods to others. Um, in, and something that I wasn't even looking for. This was not a reason why I picked up Nextflow. I just really wanted to scale up on the cloud. So as I've gone through this, I think there are some, some core concepts. Uh, these are not terms. So I want to I compare a few different workflow managers. So some caveats here. I did not help write any of these things. There are people in the room that helped write multiple of these things. So I might say something wrong. I might use a term that's not really accurate. If so, I apologize. Uh, feel free to just correct me right now or, or later if you want to be polite. Um, but when people think about workflow managers, there's a, there's a few of them that are really popular. Um, so Cromwell developed by the Broad, Nextflow obviously, Snake make a bunch of people know about, Galaxy I'm putting up here because people like it. Um, people also use Airflow. I'm not an expert in all these things. I've used, I've used Cromwell and Nextflow, and I've read up on SnakeMake. But I think that there are some really important differences between these that are worth highlighting. Um, because people will say, well, why do you use Nextflow? Why don't you use SnakeMake? Um, why don't you use Cromwell? Why don't you use Airflow? And if you have some concept of how these things are different from each other, I think that helps explain why it is that, that we like using these. So the three different uh, concepts, I don't love these names, so I'm talking about process control, dependency model, and execution mode. Um, and at least one of these has already been referred to today, which is nice. So we talk about process control. Um, what I think about this is, how do you declare what the processes are and how they relate to each other? So with something like Cromwell, when you start a workflow in Cromwell, the first thing that it does is it builds a graph of all the tasks that will be executed and how they relate to each other. 
seeing as the rim process and task are getting exchanged here a little bit, but hopefully this makes sense. You have you have something like a scatter step. You have chain tasks. You have multiple. In, you can have multiple independent um, processes. You might have some joins across them. This is defined before any of the tasks are executed in Cromwell. I'm pretty sure that's right. Lee's checking. Uh, kind of, maybe, sort of. It's sort of true. Um, in something like Snakemake, instead, you define what the output files are that you want, and then you define what the input files are that can be used to make these, uh, and then also the rules. So in this case, the rule would be something like use this Docker image and this command with these inputs, and that'll make the output file. This is the core concept of snake make. I mean, this is the core concept of make, right? Um, next flow, the way I think about um, everything in next flow is you have channels that move data um, through processes. And so I think the, the corollary of this is how do you know when you should run a call? How do you know that when you should actually execute, execute a command, which is like submit a job to AWS or have a system call on your system, right? How do you know that should happen? So in Cromo, you would do that because a node exists in this execution graph, right? Regardless of when exactly that's defined, it's this, this sort of graph-based thing. Um, in Snakemake, you'll know to run something because the target file doesn't exist. So it's actually very closely married to the notion of a file structure. Uh, which I think is really important to note as a difference with Nextflow. Nextflow, everything's completely divorced from a file structure until you output everything at the end. Um, anything that's make-based, you're thinking about files at the, from every single step of the way. And then obviously in, in Nextflow, you know that you should run a call because a process has received the appropriate set of inputs. So you have data moving through channels, and once a process has the right number of inputs, the right set of inputs, then you know to execute that call and consume those inputs. So I think that these, it's, when I started trying to learn you know, which workflow manager to use, what are the differences, at their core, even though these are all workflow managers, these are doing very different things. Their concept is very different from each other. So if you encounter some, some person who has experience with Snakemake, they say, oh, it's, it's the same thing. It's not the same thing. They're actually very, very different things. They just happen to fill the same piece of our sort of life as scientists. When you think about what it is, how is it that science actually happens? There's a hole that workflow managers fit in and it just happens that you can slot very different things into that hole and that's how I think about these different um, software projects. So, so the last thing I wanna mention is execution mode and this is actually that came up earlier. Um, so there's a, a mode that you can run Cromwell in where if this is the case where you want to run multiple workflows. Maybe it's the same workflow running on three different input data sets, or maybe it's three different workflows running on three different input sets. It doesn't matter. You have three batches of things you want to run. Um, there's something, this notion of a server mode in Cromwell where all of these can be submitted to a single process that will then accept those and coordinate with the execution. So uh, executing all the jobs on AWS or whatever it is. Um, and this means that the server can have one persistent database of cache calls. And the implication of this, or the, the result of this, is that if all three of these workflows have to index the same genome, and that happened once, first here, then the server can say, well, that's, that's in the cache, so I'm going to retrieve that uh, for this workflow and also for this one. So you can share cached calls across workflows. Um, in contrast, so that's Cromwell. In contrast, right now with Nextflow, each of these would have to get their own process. Um, and the only implication, each of those processes can coordinate with the same execution environment. Um, but the, the implication is that you can't share these caches across concurrently running workflows. Um, and I guess, given the audience, this is partly education and partly, I'll throw, I'll throw my name in the hat for someone who would also like to see something like server mode in Nextflow. I think it would be really nice. Um, but this is also a way in which Cromwell has a way of functioning that is actually completely different from the way that I assume Snakemake and also Nextflow function. Um, and so, so a lot of the architecture concerns are, uh, might be impacted by that. So I've talked a lot about what workflow managers are. And I want to really switch gears here because I only use Nextflow because I find it really useful. Um, I'm not a tools guy. I, I, I think tools are only interesting, period. If they're useful, some other people may not feel that way, that's totally fine, but I'll just say, since I'm the one on the microphone, tools are only interesting because they're useful, and I found Nextflow to be incredibly useful. So I'm gonna tell you a couple of the ways in which I have. 
So to tell you about this, I'm going to tell you a little bit about microbiome research at Fred Hutch. So Fred Hutch is a cancer research center. Um, we were, we, they were very pivotal in the development of um, how to do bone marrow transplants back in the 70s safely. That was one of the core things that the institute was uh, centered around. Right now they have a big role in, in cell-based therapies and CAR T cells. But it's a cancer research institute, two or 3,000 people. Um, and we recently got a lot of, we got some internal investment to try to boost our microbiome research. There's a lot of interest in the microbiome and cancer, so we want to get this up and running. I was one of the people that was brought on as part of that initiative. So my job, I have two things that I do. One is supporting microbiome researchers. So I'm invested in the success of other people at Fred Hutch who are researching the microbiome. Didn't have an intro slide on the microbiome, so I'm just gonna assume that's fine. <laughs> Realizing that now. Um, so the other thing that I do is conduct some independent research. So I also have an area that, that I'll tell you about a little bit at the very end here. So, the way in which I found it to be the most effective to support other researchers at my institute has been to share and develop NextFlow workflows and enable them to get their own compute done. Um, now, I only point this out because I've tried a lot of different ways to support people, and this happens to have been the most effective. Um, so I want to tell you a little bit about why that is. So when you think about how you might support a scientist who needs to get something done, one option would be to act as a, as a core facility and to say, I will receive data, I will do analysis, I will give it back to you, you will tell me how that analysis went. And I think maybe because I work in the world of microbiome where things are not that standardized, where things are really rapidly evolving, um, this does not end up being a linear process, this ends up being a feedback loop. And when I get feedback from someone on the analysis, the feedback is usually do it again with different parameters. And um, that communication, as someone who exists uh, at a, even a different lab, this feedback process of someone communicating back to me and then me having to get new results them ends up being very time consuming. Uh, and so this, this portion, unfortunately, ended up being one of the biggest things holding people back. So instead of enabling other researchers, I was actually being so helpful with taking their data that I was making them slower in getting their job done. I don't think this is because of how I was doing my job. I'd like to think this is just because this model was very difficult in the world of the microbiome. So another option you can imagine if you want to support people um, would be to train them and say, here, this is how you get your work done. Um, the way that, you know, when you think about training people in core tools, you're talking about competency in a really large number of things. You could say, well, here's how you use the command line. Here's the concept of 16S analysis. Here's the concept of de novo genome assembly. There's a lot of different things that people do in the world of the microbiome. Really just a conceptually a really wide range of things. And you end up having to train people in a really large number of incredibly idiosyncratic and breakable software packages. And there are other people like the Carpentries that have put a lot of time and effort in how to train people effectively. And I'm really not gonna do a better job than the Carpentries could in getting people up and running and being effective computational biologists. And so the third option, the, the one that I found um, most profitable has been to train people in how to use NextFlow and then provide a workflow that they can use to run their data. So they're in charge of figuring out where their data is, making a manifest, submitting the job, waiting to see if it finished, figuring out how to run this again and again. All the things that are in, that are in their court are the things that only they know. And all the things that I'm providing are the things that, that I know. Like this is how you chain pieces of software together in order to do de novo assembly and 16S analysis and things like that. So a couple of different things that, um, oh, so that's right, I also made this. Um, so I, my experience has been that having, having this approach has really changed the learning curve, has changed the shape of the learning curve, okay? So think about this bottom line as learning what the command line is, learning about different modules, learning how to execute something, learning how to do debugging, and then maybe you get how to, using Chime and how to do de novo assembly and Envio, you know, this is, this is a hard process. It takes a lot of time to make progress. When you start handing people over workflows, they're immediately able to get work done. And then as time goes by, they're able to pick up more and more of how this is happening, debug things, develop their own workflows, make improvements. So I really think that starting with workflows gives people an opportunity to make an immediate impact in their own research, to make progress. Um, and I don't think it holds anyone back from being a more competent uh, data scientist, computational biologist in the long run. Um, 
So what are the actual analysis workflows? Um, so these are the things that you may see contributed to NF Core, hopefully in the not too distant future. Uh, but these are things that I uh, and my colleagues made because this is what people doing microbiome ne research needed the most at Fred Hutch. Um, so one thing that we do in the microbiome is we analyze this one gene, it's called the 60 nest gene. Uh, every bacteria has one. It kind of tells you who that bacteria is. Is it E. coli? Is it C. diff? Is it name your bacteria? You look at that gene. So we do amplicon sequencing and we do taxonomic analysis. A colleague of mine uh, is much better at this type of analysis than I am, Jonathan Golub. And so he actually made this wonderful Nextflow pipeline. I'm really happy that I managed to convert him to the gospel of, of Nextflow. And he was implementing this really nice phylogenetic approach, which is kind of all the rage in 16S these days, of being able to do taxonomic assignment using phylogenetics, um, developed by another researcher, Fred Hutch, Eric Madsen. Um, and so he has this uh, pipeline, it's in his repo, it's called Maliampi, Maximum Likelihood Amplicon Pipeline, uh, and it works really well. So when I say it works really well, I had a colleague who did a 16S experiment, so they had a couple dozen FASTQ files, and they had never seen the command line before. Like, never seen the command line at all. And they were able to learn how to use Nextflow, so I sat down with them, I said, this is how you load Nextflow, this is how you run Nextflow, let's set up your config. So we already had AWS Batch just ready and, re ready and waiting, and we said, here's your config profile. I'll help you put that on your computer. Now all you need to do is make a manifest file, make a run script. I don't know if everybody else calls them these things. Two files, then you run the run script. And she was able to go from never having seen the command line to having output data that was actually really pertinent to answering her question in under two weeks. Which to me was just, I was, I was so happy. It was breathtaking. Full 16S analysis in the hands of someone who can now go do it again and again from zero to the entire thing in under two weeks. I was, this really convinced me that this would be the right way to go. Um, another thing that people like to do is de novo assembly. Uh, so you take small bits of genomes and you build up large genomes. There's a great piece of software called Unicycler. This is something people do in again and again. Uh, made a very simple workflow called Unicycler NF. Um, and this is something that's being used by multiple labs. Tend to be uh, technician level, graduate student technicians, and in some case postdocs who run this. PIs really aren't interested, but people who need to get the work done, uh, pick it up. And the third one that actually was, this is the first one I did, was interactive pangenome analysis. So there's this amazing piece of software called Onvio. So if you don't know about it, this is a graphical user interface for exploring metagenomic samples, microbiome samples, that let you annotate and do amazing analysis, get publication quality figures. It's made by an academic lab, the Marin Lab at the University of Chicago. And all I needed to do was write an Excel script that took in FASTA files of genomes and ran three or four different commands, and it gave you a, uh, and, then it, and then it would just boot up a, a Docker instance so you could get this interactive and just load everything into, into Onvio. So, in within you know, a couple of minutes, you can go from having flat FASTA files to having an interactive dashboard that somebody else made really nicely. Um, and this is an amazing point of entry for people figuring out what's different about my bacteria compared to all other bacteria. So these are really the, the pulls. These are the things to draw people in, in a sense, because now they see the utility of doing Nextflow. But in a much more you know, real sense, this is what people needed just to get their own research done. So I want to talk a little bit. Um, I know I have five minutes left on the clock, so I hope you'll indulge me here. I would like to take questions, but I want to tell you a little bit about the, the research that I do and the way that Nextflow has made this uh, much more uh, productive for me. So my area is analyzing the microbiome. I'm really interested in analyzing the microbiome on the basis of the genes encoded by bacteria. So instead of saying it's whether or not it's, uh, instead of saying E. coli is associated with colorectal cancer, I'd like to find out which genes within the E. coli pan genome are associated with colorectal cancer. So there's some proof of concept work that got published a few months ago that I did with a colleague where we found that this basic idea of associating genes with human disease, so we're talking about microbial genes, microbes are very diverse, different bacteria within the same species might have thousands of genes or hundreds of genes that are different. Um, and so we were able to do this where each point in this association uh, is a group of microbial genes. And we find that across independent cohorts of people, there's a really surprisingly high amount of reproducibility between the genes associated with colorectal cancer, human colorectal cancer, 
paired with the stool microbiome across both cohorts. And this lets us go through and identify specific isolates of bacteria that we think uh, might be responsible for the linkage between the microbiome and colorectal cancer. So I thought this was, um, you know, the concept was good. So now it's time to actually roll this out as a tool. So I spent a lot of time making a reference database. So this is sort of a schematic figure, which I won't go through. Um, doing this whole thing took months and months. Uh, not making the figure, uh, do, doing the work in the figure took months and months. Uh, the figure was made by a, a really wonderful um, undergraduate uh, or a recent graduate. And what I ended up doing was breaking this up uh, in so that uh, different components of this were executed by different workflows. Um, and I did it in this way because uh, each step would take things like weeks to a month, and then at the end of each of these components, I ended up having very small or relatively smaller outputs that were very condensed. But the thing I want to tell you about is how I use this reference database in order to analyze published data sets. So now I have a tool that's building on this proof of concept, and I said, I'd really like to see how it looks running this tool on, I don't know, maybe every microbiome study that's ever been published. I would love to know the answer. Um, when someone publishes a microbiome study, they put the raw data up in NCBI, SRA. Can I just grab all that down and, and run all this through? So the tool is pretty simple. So all I have to do is a little processing, a little alignment, a little filtering. Uh, the reference database makes a big difference here in the aggregating of the results. Um, and so I thought, well, if I want to make this into a tool that anybody can run, surely I'm going to have to figure out who, how to install dependencies, manage all these things, parallelize them. Well, no, actually, I don't have to worry about any of those things. Uh, I just had to write the syntax for it, and once I have it written in Nextflow, now this is a tool. Um, I could publish this as a tool that anyone can use for their microbiome analysis um, just by virtue of having written the syntax down in the correct way within Nextflow, which to me is, is really amazing and kind of makes me more interested in being a tool developer if I don't have to worry about any of these other things. So actually running this on a data set uh, kind of looks like this. So I don't know who is able to get the start time out of the trace files, but I could just get the submitted time. So there's a bunch of different steps. Each line is a step. So when you have, for example, 400 means these are 400 basically concurrently running steps. Um, and I've noted their start time and then their duration. Um, so you can see a bunch of this is actually downloading the data from, or I'm telling you, a bunch of this is downloading data from SRA, which takes a long time. It only gets one CPU, but it takes a long time. Um, and then you have to do some pre-processing, and then you do all this alignment and filtering and then summarizing the results. So wrote down the syntax in the right way, right way on Nextflow, and then I was able to analyze hundreds of samples in one go, um, all on AWS, uh, and it just coordinated all of this for me. I don't have to, to worry about this, as, as you can imagine. So this is how you'd imagine it working on, on one data set. What I was really interested in was actually how to run this on everything. So um, I was only able to do this for some generous support from Amazon, because this is actually a relatively large task. So we're talking about 17,000 samples. Uh, metagenomic samples are typically like a couple of gigabytes compressed, fast queues. Um, so, so we're talking about, you know, what, terabytes of, of raw data coming in. These are across 26 different published studies, and when you tally up all the individual calls that were made on AWS on batch for this, it was something like 44,000. Oh, so the, the, if you just count the, the hours of tenancy on a, uh, for a particular task, not the CPU hours, just the total hours, we're looking at something like um, uh, seven, I think seven years of, of computer time that was taken up. And when you look at how this was executed, um, this was actually executed over about a week. Most of the time here was just downloading from SRA, and then a little bit of the time in here was sort of debugging. I think there was a weekend in here somewhere, uh, maybe over there. So I was able to process all of the microbiome data that's been published uh, on AWS, admittedly scaling to very large size, but I didn't have to worry about coordinating any of the scaling. So has this made me more productive? Yeah, this made me much, much more productive than if I was trying to coordinate this manually. Because uh, we're talking about keeping track of thousands of concurrently running jobs uh, over really, uh, really an immense scale. So it's something that is, has been incredibly useful for me. So now I have these associations of genes across 20 different published studies where we have information on each sample and whether or not they came from someone with inflammatory bowel disease, with colorectal cancer. Some of these studies look at obesity or inflammation. There's, just a, there's so many different health conditions that have, been, uh, that have been captured here. And because I can apply the same analysis across all of these studies and know that it was performed 
the exact same way with the exact same reference database because I'm controlling the dependencies, because I'm controlling all the data inputs, because Nextflow is controlling all that for me. Now I'm able to actually do a real meta-analysis. And I'm, I'm able to say, are the parts of the microbiome associated with cancer the same in study A and study B and study C? Which of these associations are artifacts? Which of these associations would I think are, would be true in a, in a new population of, of, uh, of, of patients that are taken in? So being able to really scale up and do this type of meta-analysis across large amounts of data is something I never even would have thought of possible uh, before I started working with Nextflow. So for me personally as a scientist, it's given me um, uh, just an ability to have much more impact on the field and start to answer some of these questions that are really important. So I've, I've told you a lot about sort of why I came to Nextflow um, and the fact that it makes things easier to do cloud computing and all the everything else that came along with it. Um, so I really do think that it's made me a more productive scientist. Um, and I think that this ability to communicate methods means that we can make our fellow scientists also much more productive at the same time. Um, so thank you very much for your time and attention. I'm happy to take any questions. Talk a little bit about costs of work done closer affiliated with an academic institution versus cost affiliated with the what? Like a like a university or, or the, the, no, the, the Hutch, yeah. Versus cloud and the cost difference there. Yeah, so the, the question is about cost. So how does cost on the cluster compare to cost on AWS? Um, that's a good question. I don't know the answer. Um, so oh I didn't mention. So actually all of this, so this is actually kind of the whole point, sorry. Um, all of this was done using spot instances. So I don't actually know what the price was for each one, but I will say that, so when we're talking about thousands of concurrently running jobs, these are all running on preemptible instances that you can bid on the price. So you could say, oh, it costs 20% more, I don't know what the number is, it costs X percent more on AWS to run. Well, that's how much I wanna lower the price. So you get to pick what the price is that you wanna pay compared to the, compared to the list price. Um, and when you do that in Nextflow, that means that if some of your instances don't start up, if some of your instances get killed because you've asked, you've bid too low, um, which happened a lot in here. So I haven't actually tallied it up, but there was a lot of these periods of time in here, maybe it's right here, where in fact all of my jobs got killed because someone else paid more money. And that had zero impact on my work because Nextflow just requeued the jobs and then as soon as the price went back down, we got to, to do it again. So there was, there is a big piece on cost here, but I don't have the numbers for you, partially because I don't think that our center publishes those numbers, um, and partially because a lot of this has to do with how you make computing much more effective using spot instances. So that was a big piece of this. Uh, Olga, do you have a question? Yeah, uh, I had a question comment. For the person that tweeted about um, the job security. Yeah. Um, I think part, I think many people would love to um, share more workflows and stuff, but I think part of the issue that I think you're lucky to maybe not experience as much at the Hutch is that uh, my rotation, if they're, if they're the only one around the workflow, that means they're the one who gets on the publication and not someone else. And I think um, something that is not, um, I don't have the answer for, that I don't know if anyone here maybe has a perfect solution, but I think it's also important to address the um, incentive structure is associated with academia and um, that it can be difficult. Part of why it is difficult to write reproducible software in academia is because the incentives aren't there, um, as in my opinion. Um, that you're more incentivized to be the only one who can write run the workflow because then you get on three different papers as opposed to having one methods paper and then getting excited about it. So, um, yeah, I just wanted to throw that out there. I don't know, do you have any people I can, I can completely echo that. So just to, to generally restate, when we, talk about, um, when we talk about communicating the value of this approach, and we have to think about the real incentive structures that, that exist, and people might not have an incentive to bring on to share their methods if by not sharing them they get more citations, they, they're more useful. So I, I can definitely echo this. So with my personal story, I walked into an institution that did not have someone doing bioinformatics as a service for the microbiome. There were zero other people. There was a complete vacuum, so I got to do whatever it is that I wanted. Um, I will say that I have not seen people in bioinformatics core positions um, at, I've, I've seen a slower uptake, let's say, for something like Nextflow among the more established members of the sort of the bioinformatics core community. Um, and 
uh, at Fred Hutch, and so that's definitely the next place that I'm looking, is how do I communicate the value of something like NextFlow to someone who, uh, who already has everything running? Uh, you gotta, I definitely have come across this point where when you say you have a new tool that it would be helpful for someone else, that's inherently a challenging statement because the subtext is you're not doing everything right. You could be doing better means you're doing bad um, when some people hear this. And I think that's, that's such a real thing um, that I'd, I'd like to hear. Hopefully, I can come back in a year and give a, a five-minute talk on how I've been able to make progress in that area, because I'd like to. Um, but I think that's a, that's a really great observation. Thank you. German? talked about the process of downloading the data of your intended to part of the project. Aside from that, how could you make this happen? Scaling up with more compute with more spot? Is that going to trick or how would you take this measure from one day? Um so what were the major, so how, how could this have been faster? So we're talking about analyzing, uh, doing 44,000 different tasks over the course of a week. What actually held me back from doing this? Like what are the lessons learned? So the first is when you ask SRA for a thousand things at one time, you're kind of DDoSing it um, and it just breaks. So everything, I got cascading failures from NCBI. So if I had some way of accessing NCBI that wasn't through um, Entree, that, that would probably be the biggest thing. There's some of these tasks. So for example, a family is, well, it takes kind of a long time. This is an algorithm I wrote in Python. Um, so if someone wanted to re-implement that in a compiled language, that would be really nice. That probably took some time. And then the other piece that I'd say is that there are blank pieces in here. And this is because, Okay, real uh, little honesty here. I had 26 Tmux tabs open, and I was manually restarting them when they would go down occasionally. So they go down when spot. So Nextflow will die after a certain number of I don't know failures. I don't know what exactly the rule is, but the entire thing will come down after a certain amount of time. Um, so automatically restarting the workflow when it failed was something that I figured out how to do with a little bash foo. And it was actually what resulted in something like I'd, you know, I'd go to sleep and I'd get a lot of blank time because it just so happened that a couple of the workflows would go down. So the fact that I had to run each of the workflows in different tabs and different processes, um, I think maybe held back the total time a little bit. Um, and then the, the, the second thing would be the fact that some of this is code that I wrote. Um, it's the only piece of code that I wrote. I mean, well, yeah, mostly in the entire thing. So making that faster, but then I think the biggest thing actually was just getting the raw data from NCBI was probably the biggest impact on time. Yeah? Yeah. What's your experience of trying to run huge jobs for the economics of the meaning Assembly, core assembly of multiple samples. Is that a thing that you can do? You're talking about doing assembly, metasomic assembly? Not of a single sample, but core assembly of many samples for you. Oh. So we should. So the, the question was, what was my experience doing metagenome, doing assembly and assembly across multiple samples? We should talk more about this because it's probably not for the general audience. But I didn't do that because I didn't. Uh, so that's sort of the whole idea of building a reference database is that I, I do the assembly once and then I extract reference data and by doing all this processing I'm able to um, analyze all this published data sets by just mapping against the reference data which is much less time consuming, much more, much more efficient of resources and if you map against a reference then your measurements are comparable across different studies so you can do meta-analysis if you don't do assembly. Assembly is very challenging for something like cross-sample comparison, so it doesn't scale for the reasons that you sort of described, which is the reason that I didn't do it, and I did this instead. Yeah, we can talk about that more. Yeah? So now that you did all this analysis, how are you distributing it? Great question. So now I've done all the analysis, how am I distributing it? Um, so I thought a lot about this. So analyzing a single data set, so one of these might be 8,000 samples, one of these might be 80 samples. Um, I decided that the way I wanted to do it was to so align the sample, uh, align everything, um, do all this sort of cross analysis, uh, 
I ended up putting everything together into a single HDF5. So it's basically like three or four tables, abundance information, annotation, sample metadata, other things that aren't important. Um, so I put that all into an HDF5 and then people said, I don't know what that is. And so I also output them all as CSVs. So if you want to, you can go to the CSV, but I think HDF5 is the best way to have tabular data that is self-annotated. Um, so that's my, that's my answer. Uh, how much time do I, I don't want to keep going too long, but I love answering questions. You want to do two more? Is that a, one more? Is that fine? Oh, I'm looking. No. Yeah, one. Okay. Who, has, who has one last question? Okay, great. Mine's Sorry, very quick. we can talk later. Yeah. Mine's very quick. Shoot. Um, how many things can you download at once from NCBI without breaking? Oh, um... I, oh, sorry, the question is how many things can you download from NCBI at once without breaking? I'd say probably a couple of hundred. I'm not totally sure. I think it depends on how many times you ask it to start. Um, I think if you have a thousand things asking at the same time, then it hates it. And then if you just stagger them a bit, it would be better. I'm not really sure. Okay, thanks everybody. Happy to talk more.